Intel's history with locked and unlocked parts goes back a long time. Let's take a trip down memory lane. To give a processor its operating frequency, you need two things, a reference clock and a multiplier. For most modern CPUs, there's a crystal on the motherboard used by either the CPU or chipset to produce an internal reference clock of 100 megahertz. This 100 megahertz is then multiplied using a PLL to achieve the final operating frequency. To lock a processor to a specific frequency, you, therefore, need to lock three parts, the crystal, the reference clock, and the multiplier. Intel's story of locking processors for enthusiasts and overclockers begins in mid-1998. Leading up to the crackdown on overclocking, Intel was upset that people would buy a lower spec part and then overclock it to get higher performance. There were two main reasons why Intel was upset. First, at the time, the operating frequency was a key selling point of the CPU as it was the main differentiator of compute performance. For every additional 33 megahertz, Intel could charge a significant premium. Therefore, there was a direct financial impact when customers buy a lower rated part and run it at the frequency of the most expensive part. Of course, today's situation is very different as there is a wide variety of performance differentiating features such as core count, integrated graphics, and memory speed support. Two, people set up businesses selling remarked processors. Remarked processors are lower spec parts sold as higher spec parts. One could argue that this is the same as pre-bin CPUs, though it's not quite the same. A remarked CPU would be advertised and sold as a different product out of the box. In contrast, a pre-bin CPU is still advertised and sold as the original product, but with a specific overclocking capability. There was a significant financial incentive to remark processors. A 350 nanometer Pentium II 233 Klamath processor was listed at 636 US dollar, while its bigger brother, the Pentium II 300, was listed at a whopping 1981 US dollar. However, things changed when the 250 nanometer Deschutes Pentium II came to market. While early and engineering samples had an unlocked multiplier, most parts were multiplier locked. For overclockers, that left only the reference clock to overclock the CPU. The soon overclocking will end meme has been around for a long time, as proven by the opening lines of a 1998 Tom's Hardware article. The main reason for the desperate feeling among PC enthusiasts was that Intel would not only multiplier lock, but also bus lock its processors. Despite the great fears in 1998, it took Intel a very long time to put constraints on the reference clock overclocking. That said, the Pentium 3 processors were all multiplier locked. This enabled a great point of differentiation for motherboard vendors, as the ability to increase the reference clock was now a key selling point for PC enthusiasts. The reference clock became one of the main battlegrounds for competitive overclocking. By 2010, the highest reference clock frequency had increased from less than 200 MHz of the Pentium 3 slot 1 to over 700 MHz. Incredibly, the world record of 750 MHz set on October 30th, 2009 by Indonesian overclocker Benny Lodewijk stood for more than a decade. Only last year, a Chinese overclocker by the name of WYTIWX beat the record. The highest ever reference clock frequency now stands at 766.1 MHz. Overclocking the reference clock not only helped to increase the CPU frequency, but it also provided a significant performance uplift for the front side bus. For the younger viewers among you, back in the old days, a motherboard would have two chips, the North Bridge and the South Bridge. The North Bridge would host not only the memory controller hub with access to the system memory, but in some cases, also links to high-speed graphics buses like AGP or PCI Express. The South Bridge contained all connections to I.O. like low-speed PCIe, SATA, USB, and so on. The North Bridge and the CPU would connect with a high-speed frontside bus. As this bus transfers data between memory or graphics and the CPU core, it's easy to understand that a higher frequency would undoubtedly provide much higher performance. 
For overclockers, a high frontside bus was one of the primary ways to get more performance alongside, of course, a higher CPU frequency and higher system memory frequency. This is relevant to our story of locking the CPUs, and we'll get back to that later. But first, let's return to the year 2003. 2003 was a critical year for Intel for several reasons. One, Intel's NetBurst microarchitecture which set out to achieve clock frequencies of up to 10 GHz by 2011, turned out to be a wrong design choice as it ran into physical limitations like heat and power. As a result, Intel had to abandon the development of Texas and Jayhawk products. Two, the industry experienced a paradigm shift away from the frequency raise and onto the multi-core race to chase performance improvements. Three, AMD launched the Athlon 64, the very first consumer 64-bit processor and the first processor with an integrated memory controller. 4. Intel launched their very first Extreme Edition processor to counter the Athlon 64, which media generally saw as a marketing tactic to divert attention away from the significant strides forwards of their competitor. In other words, 2003 was not a great year. Intel's first Extreme Edition processor, the Pentium 4 Extreme Edition 3.2 GHz, launched on November 3rd, 2003, about a week before AMD unveiled their first Athlon 64 processor. The Extreme Edition is a 169 million transistor Pentium 4 running at 3.2 GHz with hyper-threading support. It also supports a 2 MB on-die L3 cache, in addition to the standard 512 KB on-die L2 cache. Anantec informed Intel that a processor would be truly worthy of the Extreme Edition name if its multiplier were unlocked for overclocking. It wasn't until the Pentium Extreme Edition 840, released on May 1st, 2005, that Intel would fully unlock the CPU multiplier. It was the first time in almost five years that enthusiasts could overclock without changing the reference clock frequency. Intel would provide their customers with locked regular processors and unlocked Extreme Edition processors going forward. The last Extreme Edition release is the Intel Core i9-10980XE Extreme Edition Cascade Lake processor for X299 motherboards launched on November 25th, 2019. Unlocking the CPU ratio multiplier offered Intel three key benefits. First, it allows Intel to claim feature parity with AMD's FX product line, which offered an unlocked multiplier on the first Athlon 64 FX51 processor launched in September 2003. Second, it helps justify charging a significant premium for the Extreme Edition processor as unlocked multipliers offer added value over locked processors. Third, it enables Intel to fight at the top of the performance leaderboards, whether in media reviews or overclocking benchmark records. It would have made a fantastic business model if the Extreme Edition CPUs were the perennial leaderboard top spot holder. But Intel had a problem. Reference clock overclocking. By the time Intel started rolling out its unlocked Extreme Edition processors in 2003, Motherboards with the contemporary 865P chipset could run the reference clock frequency well above 300 MHz and thus offer more than 50% overclocking headroom. When Conroe came around in 2006, it was clear. The overclocking headroom of the reference clock and frontside bus frequency was more than enough to overcome the locked multiplier limitation. As a result, Enthusiasts were buying the cheaper processors and would very easily overclock them to match or exceed the performance of the Extreme Edition processor. Even when it comes to the liquid nitrogen overclocking leaderboards, the Extreme Edition wasn't necessarily the way to go. The fastest Conroe or Kensfield processor is still a 5.9 GHz Core 2 Duo E6850 and the fastest Wolfdale or Yorkfield processor is a 6.9 GHz Core 2 Duo E8600. By the end of the LGA775 era, the reference clock overclocking capabilities exceeded 700 MHz, far above the default frequency of 333 MHz, and offering more than enough headroom for any processor. When the Halim came around in November 2008, things started to move slowly away from reference clock overclocking. 
or we should call it base clock overclocking now as per Intel terminology. The base clock was significantly reduced to 133 megahertz and the front side bus technology made way for Intel's quick path interconnect technology. Most importantly, Nehalem introduced two important technologies, turbo mode and the power control unit. Turbo mode is a technology that allows the CPU cores to run faster than the base frequency if there is sufficient power, thermal and current headroom. The power control unit is a controller managing the CPU cores. It has its own firmware and uses inputs like temperature, current, power and operating system requests to manage the CPU core frequency and power. Long story short, the PCU controls the CPU. Together, these two parts would play a pivotal role in the upcoming crackdown on overclocking. We'll get back to that story, but let's first finish up on the reference, I mean, base clock overclocking. The Nehalem platform for desktop was split into two distinct segments, high-end desktop with Bloomfield and mainstream desktop with Linfield. While Bloomfield processors generally had a base clock hard wall at about 220 megahertz, which could be overcome by increasing the PCIe frequency, Linfield suffered less from a BCLK overclocking limitation. While the maximum frequency dropped significantly from the record highs of over 750 megahertz to below 300 megahertz, the base clock frequency range was still more than sufficient. There is perhaps no better example than HWBOT's W1024M leaderboard ranking, which has a mix of Core i7 Extreme Edition, Xeon, and the cheapest Bloomfield topping the charts. The BCLK overclocking range improved with Nihalem's successor, Westmere, which had Gulftown for the high-end desktop and Clarkdale for the mainstream desktop. While the Gulftown 980X and 990X were the way to go for multi-threaded benchmarks, a Core i7-970 could still be competitive given your motherboard would provide sufficient base clock headroom. However, when it comes to raw overclocking capability and maximum frequency, the cheapest Core i5 and Core i3 Clarkdale processors would be right up there above 7 GHz with the most expensive Core i7s, thanks to the BCLK overclocking headroom. But then came Sandy Bridge and everything came to a screeching halt. No more BCLK overclocking. Page 5 of Anantic's Sandy Bridge preview article is titled Overclocking Controversy and accurately captures the sentiment of the PC enthusiast community. Three things had changed since Intel's decision to lock the CPU ratio. First, through the extreme editions, Intel had begun experimenting with multiplier unlocked processors and had been able to evaluate the impact on its business from various angles. The marketing benefit, the financial benefit, and impact on return rates, for example. Second, starting from Penryn and later adopted in Nihalem with Turbo Boost technology, Intel now has a way to exploit the overclocking headroom out of the box. Third, with the integration of the power control unit, Intel had a much tighter grip on everything related to overclocking. While Nihalem still relied on an external clock generator provided by the motherboard, Intel integrated the clock generator for Sandy Bridge in the PCH. As it would turn out, the BCLK overclocking capabilities of Sandy Bridge processors were extremely limited, as it was tied to the DMI and PCIe clocks. The best BCLK overclock is still only 111.86 MHz, not even 12% higher than the base frequency of 100 MHz. So just like Tom's Hardware Guide had predicted in 1998, Overclocking is dead, right? Not quite. Intel had made several important decisions that would ensure overclocking was alive and well. Since 2009, the company had experimented with much more affordable multiplier unlocked K processors. The first K processor was the Pentium E6500K, a multiplier unlocked Wolfdale processor launched exclusively in China. Following what I assume had been a successful experiment, in May 2010, Intel introduced the Core i7-875K Linfield and Core i5-655K Clarkdale processors. While the Core i5 model was priced $40 higher than its locked counterpart, surprisingly, the Core i7 model was priced significantly lower than its locked counterpart. With the launch of Sandy Bridge, 
Intel introduced the K business model to the broader market, a slightly higher priced but fully unlocked model alongside a locked counterpart. So overclocking was safe, right? Well, sort of. Sandy Bridge's overclocking controversy didn't end with just the limited base clock overclocking. There was actually a lot of problems with Sandy Bridge overclocking. First, Intel forced the customer to choose between overclocking or using integrated graphics. The P67 chipset would support CPU overclocking, but wouldn't allow for the integrated graphics and its very useful quick sync acceleration. The H67 chipset would enable full use of the integrated graphics, but disabled the overclocking capability. So if you bought a Core i7-2600K, you had to choose OC or IGP. Fortunately, Intel swiftly addressed this controversy by introducing the very first Z chipset, the Z68. Second, CPU ratio overclocking did not go very smoothly at all. Most CPUs would initially be limited to the 53x ratio. Only after introducing an option called internal PLL overvoltage override, you could increase the CPU ratio beyond 53x. Third, the CPU ratio range was minimal as it would only go up to 57x. That was too limited for extreme overclockers as plenty of Sandy Bridge CPUs would overclock well past 5.9 gigahertz. Lastly, Memory overclocking was also incredibly limited as Sandy Bridge offered memory ratios up to only DDR3-2133. As a result, the highest memory frequency ever achieved on Sandy Bridge processors is around DDR3-2368, and that's significantly lower than the DDR3-3200+, its mainstream predecessor Linfield was capable of. All things considered, the KSQ saved overclocking on the mainstream platform, but it was indeed severely limited. Intel had made an additional decision to unlock every processor on its high-end desktop platform. Unlocking also meant the creation of BCLK multipliers, which allowed you to run at 100, 133, 166, or 250 MHz base clock frequency. But for mainstream non-K processors, the overclocking fun was over. For Sandy Bridge, Ivy Bridge and Haswell, the maximum base clock frequency for non-K locked processors is limited to around 111 MHz. Whereas for unlocked K processors, the maximum BCLK frequency is much higher. Skylake introduced a new feature called BCLK Governor, an integrated circuit that calculates the base clock frequency at real time and will issue a machine check error if the BCLK is higher than the allowed limit. Importantly, BCLK calculation doesn't rely on using the integrated clock controller from the PCH as it works with external clocks as well. External clocks? Yes, another key new feature on Skylake was the re-enabling of full range fine grain BCLK overclocking. For this purpose, motherboard vendors could add an external clock generator to the motherboard, bypass the internal clock generator and use it as the base clock frequency. The result was quite spectacular, as the BCLK could overclock to over 550 MHz, the highest since the core two days. With this kind of BCLK overclocking range, Intel definitely needed its BCLK governor to both monitor the BCLK frequency in real time and make sure that the CPU stopped working once it exceeded a hard-coded limit. On December 2nd, 2015, Almost four months after the launch of Intel's sixth generation processors and brand new CPU architecture Skylake, the overclocking world woke up to a Core i3-6320 processor with an overclocked BCLK frequency of 120 MHz. As we'd learn in the days and weeks to come, Supermicro had found a way to work around the power control unit, which is responsible for managing the CPU's power consumption performance, as well as housing the BCLK governor. With the PCU out of the way, there was no means to check the BCLK frequency and throw an error. So non-K overclocking was back. Unfortunately, disabling the PCU came with a couple of significant drawbacks. Despite the drawbacks, some motherboard vendors went all in on promoting non-K overclocking. Most notably, ASRock had set up an entire marketing campaign for its Sky OC feature. 
As expected, Intel pressured motherboard partners to remove non-K overclocking support, and most motherboard partners withdrew official support. That said, extreme overclockers and enthusiasts could still find and use the old BIOSes with non-K OC support. The BCLK governor measures the real-time BCLK frequency and checks it against a hard-coded limitation. Since Skylake, the BCLK limitation is 103 MHz. So while the highest non-K BCLK frequency for Skylake was 213 MHz, ever since Skylake, the non-K maximum BCLK frequency is about 103 MHz. With all these restrictions in place, how on earth is it possible that we can do non-K overclocking on Alder Lake? In a previous segment, I already talked about the BCLK governor. This is a feature introduced on Skylake, which had one purpose, prevent the locked CPUs from going over 103 MHz BCLK. The BCLK governor monitors both the internal and external clock generator. Due to an apparent oversight, the BCLK governor does not function correctly on a specific older pre-release version of the CPU microcode 0x9. The BCLK governor works correctly for the integrated clock generator, but not for the external clock generator. Using this older microcode in combination with an external clock generator means you can increase the base clock frequency on a locked non-overclockable part beyond the artificial limitation of 103 MHz. We can only speculate as to why that oversight happened. One theory is that it has something to do with the fundamental change in clocking structure on Alder Lake. Since integrating the clock generator on Sandy Bridge, it's always been the PCH that generates the 100 MHz BCLK frequency. That was the case until Rocket Lake. However, first on Tiger Lake and now also on Alder Lake, the BCLK is added on the CPU die. The 38.4 MHz crystal still connects to the PCH, but instead of driving a 100 MHz clock to the CPU, the PCH now just forwards that 38.4 MHz clock to the CPU BCLK PLL. The CPU, in turn, generates its 100 MHz reference clock. This fundamental change in clocking structure may explain why the oversight occurred. Considering that this exploit or this oversight is not present in later microcodes, I don't think Intel will come down too harshly on this non-K overclocking thing. Intel can encourage motherboard partners to ship new BIOSes without this older microcode, or could even enforce updating the CPU microcode via a Windows update as it did for the unlocked Pentium G3258 Anniversary Edition and non-Z motherboards. Motherboard vendors have a couple of ways to support non-K overclocking. First, they can provide specific BIOS releases with microcode 0x9 to end users. Second, they can release BIOSes with both microcodes and allow users to choose which microcode to load. 